really, we want to be the one-stop shop. If you need to access something to make your game successful, we will support it. We even have Immutable Studios, where we're publishing six titles internally and building them. So we are the call face of what is the iOS store's policy? What is the Play Store's policy? What is Epic's policy? How do we design successful economies? How do we make the user experience good? If you have not built games internally, you will not build a good product. Hey everyone, wanted to give a quick shout out to the Wormhole Foundation. If you are a Bell Curve listener, you know that transferring across chains can be a massive pain. I certainly do. I complain about it on this program all the time. That's why we are super pumped to have partnered with the Wormhole Foundation, the stewards of the Wormhole Protocol. The Wormhole Protocol connects over 30 blockchains and six different runtimes, including Solana, Sui, Ethereum, Layer 2s, and more. And the coolest part about this particular partnership is that they have made custom bell curve NFTs, which you can get and mint for free. You can claim that by just going down into the show notes and clicking on the link. All right, guys, on with the show. Hey, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Swell, a team leading the restaking future with their liquid restaking token our suite now i've talked about liquid restaking on this program before i think it is going to be a massive tectonic shift for ethereum and i am super super excited about it and i like the swell team a lot goes without saying do your own research this is not financial advice you guys all know the drill again i like this team and if you stick around i'm going to describe how you can restake your eth in swell earn pearls eigenlayer points and a whole bunch of future rewards so thank you very much for swell for making this episode possible hey everyone wanted to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor flood protocol the optimal dex aggregator. Now, if you are a listener of Bell Curve, you know that MEV is a massive problem, which is why we are so pumped to partner up with Flood on this season. Flood is the only gasless and MEV-free aggregator that not only gets you the best execution, but also gives you back all the extra surplus that you create every single time you swap. Now, this is relevant for both swappers and developers, but you're going to be hearing all about them later in the program. So for now, thank you, Flood, and back to the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Before we jump in, quick disclaimer, the views expressed by my co-host today are their personal views and they do not represent the views of any organization with which the co-hosts are associated with. Uh, Nothing in the episode is construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or other advice. You know the deal. Now, let's jump into the episode. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. You got Michael's one and two, Vance. And today we're joined by Robbie Ferguson of Immutable. Guys, welcome. What's up? Thank you. Great to be here. Another week, another billion dollar airdrop that is uh, inexplicably, <laughs> inexplicably <laughs> staying up there. <laughs> you love this bit. Uh, Bullish for the spin. Yeah. yeah. The degeneracy is, uh, it looks like we are we are back on here and we're, we're going to take a break from from all that this weekend actually do a little bit of a special focused on uh crypto gaming and kind of get a state of the union from robbie but also michael and vance as you guys are obviously super in the weeds on the space and and yeah frankly robbie we kind of want to grill you a little bit on immutable and just the business model um some of the new stuff that you have to grill away but yeah <laughs> but before we start giving you the the third degree though can you just kind of like zoom out for a second for folks who like might not have been following the gaming ecosystem in crypto quite as closely. Can you just give us kind of like a state of the union? How are things like, you know, what, who are the different actors? Like how many games are sort of in production? Like imagine I know nothing and kind of give us a, give us a high level overview. Great. Uh, so high level thesis, what is Web3 gaming? It's the idea that when people play games and they earn or purchase digital assets in those games in Web2, they're getting zero dollars of value for it. They have no sense of ownership and no ability to trade. And this is the largest segment of gaming demand today. $150 billion is spent every single year on in-game items. This isn't the ability to play Call of Duty or or Candy Crush. It's buying the skins in those games or the coins in Candy Crush. And it's a very simple concept, which is you can take the exact same value proposition of digital ownership that Bitcoin invented and Ethereum popularized for unique assets with smart contracts and NFTs and take that to this segment of of in-game items. And the reason we were fundamentally so interested in it, it was the first category in crypto for us outside of payments that had real clear product market fit and utility. This is not speculation. This is not, hey, this might one day be real. This is every single year gamers are getting ripped off by spending money on assets they no longer have the ability to sell or trade, or they're told they have the ability to trade and then get runned. Counter-Strike Go is the perfect example of this. When we made the company in 2017, two months later, CSGO, which is the largest database-based skin trading economy in the world in Web2, uh, which trades roughly uh, $15 billion every year, they changed their policy so you could only trade assets once per week. 
And overnight, the value of these assets plummeted. They restricted third-party marketplace access and hundreds of millions of hours of gamers time and hundreds of millions of dollars of gamers money was deprecated. And we think that if you make representations like that to players, it has to be real. So that's the big, I guess, thesis of, of what it is. Now, where are we at in the industry? I would say it has been simultaneously uh, one of the most invested in categories, but also sort of the slowest to market. And the reason behind that is unlike DeFi, where you can have a uh, funding wave and Andre Cronier can slip a project into production in one month, games take between two to four years to build. And they typically don't ship on time, even for professional studios. So there's been this huge lag between the funding cycle, which was roughly two and a half years ago when we, sort of the Web3 gaming investment bull run started to when the production bull run is going to begin, when these games are going to start to launch. Uh, and 2024 is the, the year in which, from our internal metrics, roughly 35 to 40% of these games are going to go live. And that's kind of adjusting for delays on, on time. At the same time, we've seen uh, roughly $15 billion US invested into Web3 gaming over the last three to four years across infrastructure and games. Um, a good chunk of that into Immutable and Polygon. Uh, we've seen uh, a huge amount of institutional adoption. Even in the last uh, three months, we had Vanek uh, covering gaming as one of their sort of categories to be pushing the next uh, wave of adoption for, for uh, users. And it's pretty clear right now, every single blockchain in the world wants to win gaming as their number one focus. It is, if, if you can win the next 100 million users that are going to come through Web3, if you can actually deliver on the promise of invisible use cases of Web3 that radically improve consumers' lives, that is the best validation we've had of Web3 outside of payments today, uh, which is the core product market fit, I would say, we, we've reached. So that's where we're at. Uh, in terms of our view, Immutable as an enormous amount of games launching. We've just shipped Immutable ZKVM and Early Access, and these games are waiting until that goes into to mainstream launch, roughly the end of March, April. And that's when we're going to see roughly 30 games launch even by the end of July, and, and then a lot more over the rest of the year. So we're sort of uh, in the calm before the storm. We obviously have a bunch of successful content on Immutable X, um, InView with a million DAO, uh, Gods Unchained uh, with 50k Mao sort of sustained over the last few years. Uh, but really, it's it's almost a, a, a pre-launch period. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've been impressed by is just like how much resources you guys have and, and how much you're able to kind of go off and tackle. Um, could you get into kind of like the resourcing of the company, the balance sheet, but also like all the pipeline that's coming? Like, I think it's like 250, 300 games that are building on Immutable right now. Are those like 2024, 2025? What, what's the expectation there? Yeah. So I think on resourcing, the first thing is, unlike other blockchains or, or uh, companies, we focused on gaming from day one. Uh, this is our only focus. And even before we had the resourcing we did today, so we, we raised 200 million from Temasek, Tencent, Bitcraft, uh, sort of the Singaporean government uh, a couple of years ago, and, and we actually barely touched that. Um, but we really, I, I think the biggest benefit is we only focus on gaming. Our product design for gaming, our go-to-market motion is designed for gaming. And that meant even when we only had $20 million, we were able to compete toe-to-toe -to -toe with the biggest blockchains in the world. And that was because our product was custom designed for that use case, rather than us worrying about art, worrying about collectibles, worrying about DeFi, worrying about stables. We just radically focused on this. And I, I honestly think radical focus is more important than resourcing because the biggest companies in the world have tried to win gaming in Web3 and they can throw as much cash at it as they like. They can't effectively understand customers' needs, requirements. This is a very complex category creation exercise and unless you build stuff yourself it's very hard to build the right product um on the resourcing side uh we we have i think uh, more than 230 million um across immutable uh balance sheet and and foundation that's cash if you look at uh tokens um we have more than a billion dollars of, of tokens on immutable's balance sheets uh the foundation we work with which listed imx has more than two billion dollars worth of uh tokens to expand the ecosystem that is unspent and that's thanks to the efficiency with which we sort of uh, mutually align incentives with partners we work with rather than just, you know, writing grants that dump on the market. So um, well-resourced, 100% radically focused on gaming. Uh, and I think we're in a position now where we're really trying to, you know, people often ask, like, who do you think about your competitors? I think it's kind of a silly question. I think any competition is pretty zero sum at the point we're trying to tackle a trillion dollar industry with massive incumbents who have huge incentives to keep that industry locked into a Web2 database. If you know, it's it's not a winner takes all, it's going to be a market where we have to create this category together 
and the the benefit this will bring to players is going to outweigh anything we're squabbling about today. And can I touch on that, Michael? But, but a really important thing is these these games are not indie sort of long tail games. We have tens of thousands of those signed up to testnet. We we can't even track and, and run of those, right? It's build a self service product. These are games we've we've tracked, we've rated internally. They have minimum, you know, millions of dollars of funding. There might be less than 10% that have less than $1 million of the context. And uh, it's also sort of accelerating at pace. Um, so in the last eight weeks, we've onboarded over 50 games, uh, which signed, and really are focused on games that are going to deliver long-term utility and become hits. This is not how do we, you know, uh, do yield farming or, or run incentives and, and, and create the impression of hits. It's how do we have games where there's 10 million players and fundamental marketplaces that are going to sustain for the next decade. Um, and we only need three or four of those for us to start making a fundamental dent in the industry. The entire industry is hit driven. And we're talking about hits that are real Web2 hits, not a, hey, 100,000 people from Web3 are sort of interested in talking about this thing. So you literally stole my question line, but uh, I'll, I'll let that one. Sorry, uh, sorry. But uh, maybe to, to dive a little bit deeper, um, like what would you define as a traditional Web3 native game? And I know you and I have talked about this, but like what are some of the characteristics that would define Web3 native game versus like a game that would could be on Web2 and you slap a token on it and, and call it Web3? So... We really think about what Web3 games will be successful. And I realize it's slightly dodging the question, but we, we think they can come from any level of spectrum. They can be totally Web3 native. And I would argue to an extent, Illuvium is Web3 native, even they're going after a mass market audience because they have essentially tokenomics at the core of what they're doing. Their entire economy is on chain. So we really think about how much value is pointed towards giving economic empowerment. I'd say less Web3 native is when it's a game that's doing a very thin integration maybe a portion of their assets are on-chain or, or real learnable assets. But of course, you have at the very end of the spectrum, fully on-chain logic. I think we have 20 games building this. We're, we're, we're excited to support them. Um, I think that it will be at least another cycle before these start to take off beyond Web3, uh, because I think it's very difficult to onboard as a, a Web2 customer. And really, the value we have to do is not ship more content to... 200,000 monthly active users of crypto Twitter. It's shipping a game with an economy under the hood that gives people ownership and can then get 10 million players. Like that, that's actually expanding the category we're in. Um, so I, I guess that's how we think about both. Obviously, we have a ton of content like Treeverse by, by Lubify, which I think is one of the most uh, hyped Web3 titles at the moment. But still, they're going for a mainstream audience while also accessing this Web3 audience. In my mind, Web3 is going to be incredible whale monetization. They're going to be the people who want to own guilds, help sort of build the economy from scratch. Web2 is going to be the 10 million plus customers. And over time, hopefully these people get the identity of this. That's the goal. But like you have to build accessible products. Yeah, and and by the way, we have one other super hyped Web3. Like you, you'll sort of know what I'm thinking if you think about what are the top three most anticipated games. We're going to be announcing them in the next week. Very nice. Nice. I've got, a, I've got a question for you, Robbie. How would you, I think one of the things that surprised me when crypto be, uh, crypto gaming, it kind of like NFTs crossed the chasm somewhat into mainstream and you saw this really allergic reaction from gamers uh, web two, And they were like, I don't want this because they viewed it as, you know, if you add a financial component to a game, then it kind of takes away from this experience of like playing the game. And, yeah. um, you know, someone gave this example. I can't remember which podcast I heard this on, but you know, if you, if you almost think of poker, as a game, you know, that's a game, like it's fun. And the point is there's a financial component to that and it is the point, but the point and the, you know, the fun and the money are like synonymous with, with one another. So can you give us like, can you actually be a little bit more like concrete about some of the different experimentation that people are running and like, what are some like cool new, you know, without giving away anything proprietary or whatever, like what are some interesting new examples that people are running about how to actually like merge this these two things which seem disparate which is the the financial part and the gaming part poker is an interesting one i would say poker will be a subset of category of web3 games where the, the economy and the game is intertwined not many people would play poker if there weren't money involved and typically that's not what we want out of web3 games we want games that will have high retention and could succeed in web2 and suddenly we're adding all this value on the economic side I think that's necessary because otherwise it's impossible to divorce. Is the game fun or is it running on incentives and is it zero sum and will it not be able to be sustained over time? 
only when you can have net inflows because the, the autarky value, the intrinsic value of people wanting to play the game and just spend money normally is high enough, then it's sort of a sufficient base to have this explosive economy. I mean, people would play CSGO, even if they weren't a thriving asset marketplace. Now there gets to be this enormous economy built on top of it. And then I'd also say there's this Venn diagram over here of people who don't even want to play the game. They just want to play the economy of the game. And that's fantastic. But I think without this piece, people who play the game without the economy, this can't exist. Uh, and, and so that, that's kind of fundamental. I mean, some people play poker, right? And it, it kind of fits the goal on that, but it's very merged. Um, how I guess I think about this more broadly is, you know, we have to be building uh, games and economies that are sustainable. And we think about this very deeply. A lot of our experiments with Guild of Guardians are, even when you have a mobile game, you will have a huge rise in the first month that is typically 10 times the plateaued monthly active numbers of that game. And that's a very healthy way that mobile games launch. They have a huge initial launch. Most Web3 games that they went through that experience today would fail because you have this huge uprise in prices. Then you have this uh, drop-off and the reflexivity is going to kill the market and that's going to kill the players. That's why you need ways of almost like market making and, and sort of backing the value of these economies, which are some of the things we're, we're thinking about with Guild of Guardians. The final thing I'd say though is this is a very Western perspective. And I, I realize we're almost in a Western cultural sphere. I think crypto Twitter is very Western. Asia doesn't care. Asia is like, I want to spend money on games and I want to sell thousands of dollars and I will pay someone even part-time to make sure I'm like in the top ranking group. I was literally hanging out with someone in Dubai who has a full-time uh, person who plays their mobile games for them to make sure I'm in the top group, right? And like spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on these. This is, they accept that. They're not like, hey, gaming should be free to play. It shouldn't be able to impact power. So, and, and I think that's great. I, I think these are just two different audiences. There's two different styles of games, but this idea of gamers don't want to pay for power. It's a very Western-centric uh, to you. So I, 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 that's partially why I'm so bullish on, on Asia as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest games in China are pay to win. Like, th this is a cultural phenomenon that exists outside the US. Um, I, I guess getting into the the product side of the house, like, it feels like a lot of the industry has been waiting on the ZK EVM that you just launched to kind of go forward. That's like, you know, the, the kind of linchpin of a lot of the launches. Uh, you've got the Global Order liquidity book. Could you talk about you know those two and passport as well and like this coming together to to facilitate the launch of all these games? There's three central tenets to how we think about building Immutable's product. The first is security, and this is paramount. that has to come first. The reason that we built uh, with an app specific rollup, so non EVM compatible, is that was the first instance of zk proved. Uh, essentially scaling technology that was available. And, and we built that with StarCX, with Immutable X, that's live today. It's been live for the last two and a half years. Uh, with Immutable ZK EVM, we get to solve the Achilles heel of that, which is EVM compatibility. And that was really last year, the only reason we'd lose deals is because the games wanted to be able to drag and drop smart contracts from ETHL1. Now they can. And they can also build with APIs, uh, which I'll, I'll touch on in a second, which is sort of, how do we get the next 10,000 gaming customers once this really starts to exploit? Uh, ZKVN early access launched last week. And it was a huge effort from the engineering team. That, like, they, I don't think they took a day off uh, over the Christmas break. Um, we're basically testing this for the next two months, and then we'll be slowly merging into um, a full sort of marketing and mainstream launch in, in March, April, with a lot of these games going live as well. And... Overall, that's, that, that's the first tenet. The second thing we think about is under the hoods, our product strategy is uh, resolving liquidity fragmentation. And you're, this is a very popular concept in Web3 right now. I'm not jumping on the bandwagon. You can go back to my video with Bankless two years ago where I talked about this. This has kind of been goal number one uh, since day one with the company. And liquidity is fragmented at three fundamental areas of the stack today. You have liquidity fragmented at marketplaces. You have liquidity fragmented between rollups and between chains, and you have liquidity fragmented at the wallet layer. And we have three products to solve each of these. And the goal is, at the end of the day, digital ownership is nice, but if you can't get better prices for things, it doesn't matter. And liquidity drives everything. So especially when we're thinking about asset economies, when you look at a marketplace, and I, I usually bring up the diagram, but if anyone has seen that famous diagram of Craigslist, the reason Craigslist died is it tried to be the marketplace for everything. The single point of, hey, if you want to trade a house, if you want to uh, find someone to, to date or, or to do other things, if, if you want to rent a home or hire someone on the internet, 
this is the place to go. Actually, houses became Airbnb and Zillow. Labor became Upwork Isn't this and a Fiverr. Thesis? That like it is all it's the, the unbundling, basically thesis. all the the unbundling of Craigslist. Yeah, it happens. A very right? famous. Yeah, VC. Jim, Jim 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 Clark. You're either bundling or unbundling, and those are the only two ways to make money. Yeah, exactly. And our big thesis from day one in gaming was: imagine, I don't know, you're in you're in Fortnite. You earn a John Wick skin. Uh, you you get a Mickey Mouse skin. It seems like it's it's going to be next, and you want to sell it then and there for eight bucks. You got this really rare skin signed by you know, uh, Ninja or, or the latest streamer, the Zeitgeist. The best place that someone wants to sell that skin is going to be inside that gaming experience. Uh, they don't want to jump off. They don't want to write down the 24 seed words, learn what a marketplace is. 99.99% of your users are going to drop off by that point. The problem is they list that asset for sale. The buyer has to also come from that domain. And that's actually not how things are going to work. A lot of demand side liquidity is going to come from the giant marketplaces. It's going to be programmatic. Goldman Sachs will have trading desks for gaming assets in 10 years. And they're going to be trading by API. It's not by people scraping inside of Fortnite. So this is the, one of the most important areas of liquidity fragmentation today. Our global order book is very similar to a centralized order book in finance, if you've heard of it. But it's not centralized in the, in the Web3 sense, just in the sense of aggregating liquidity. And this means if you're a game, you can list an asset for sale and that buyer can come from anywhere. It can come from a third-party marketplace, Token Trove, Beam, OpenSea. It can come from APIs. It can come from a custom-built marketplace, which doesn't even look like a marketplace. We think a lot of trading is going to be contextual. So the player, I don't know, you, you, you just uh, got killed in Call of Duty. You're in the death cam. You see this dope weapon. Hey, I want to buy that exact thing. That doesn't look like a grid-by-grid -grid marketplace necessarily. And over half of our trades today are listed on one venue and bought on another. That means you're more than doubling your volume if you're a game by using this protocol. The marketplaces themselves are getting access to double the amount of trades. And my favorite thing is that we're economically empowering everyone. If you're the marketplace or venue which lists an asset, you get to take a maker fee. If you're the marketplace which buys an asset, you get a taker fee. If you're the creator of an asset, you get permanent royalties, which persist no matter where it trades and is always locked in, unlike the ability for it to be blurred or X2Y2'd. Uh, and, and that's enforced at a protocol level. We're the only protocol that, that enforces that in the world. So, I mean, that's kind of our approach number one. Uh, sorry, I won't go on too long a diatribe here. The second one, wallets, uh, which is uh, basically you, you have two kind of wallets today. You have custodial wallets like MetaMask and you have uh, sort of easy sign-on uh, wallets. And, and they range from centralized wallets where they're storing your, your servers to sort of MVC or self-custodial wallets with easy sign-on. We've gone for this path. The problem with this area is in order to create a good user experience for a gamer, you have to compromise on either security via holding their keys for them or interoperability by segmenting a wallet per game per user. And segmentation is awful because it means if you're a user and you buy 10 bucks to buy an alluvial, you then can't use that 10 bucks on any other game, which means there's literally no network effects. You just have to re-onboard with every game. Imagine you're downloading a game in the App Store and every single time you want to do an IAP, you have to re-sign up with your account. You have to deposit your credit card lines in again. Again, 95% conversion kill. What we've built is not only self-custodial, so you're in self-custody of your keys with a split MPC system. Uh, and not only does it support invisible signing, which is incredibly important. So the game can do, say, merge uh, items under the hood without you even having to, to click sign or go off app. But it does all of this while preserving interoperability of funds. Uh, and the way we accomplish this is we have immutable actors, a co-signatory, that can set permissions per game. So the problem with the, the normal model is you have to give, in order to give a smooth user experience, you have to give that game elevated privileges over signing. You have to say, okay, well, you can sign over transactions for your game. We act as a co-signatory and we're almost like, hey, how much would you like to spend on this game? What level of control do you want to give them in terms of permissions? And that means you can deposit 10 bucks in immutable passport and use it on every single game. So as soon as we have a shit game with a billion dollars deposited, every other game can access that pool of funds and the network effects and flywheel starts to build unstoppably. Gamers make more money. Games make more money. We're creating uh, sort of a, a unified liquidity context. And the final one is roll-ups. Uh, and again, I, I've spoken about this roughly 18 months ago. This is now going live this year, but... Uh, with Immutable, we're going to have uh, approaches and announced soon around uh, horizontal scaling, um, very similar to, to DKVM, but sort of custom for platforms or games. And 
essential to this is, I, I don't know if uh, anyone listening, I know Vance and Michael uh, know him, but Chainlink God, um, the pseudonym, uh, wrote a very famous piece called the L1 rotation thesis, right? It's actually one of my favorite pieces in crypto. It basically says every time there's a new bull run, Ethereum gets congested, uh, gas fees go up. This creates narrative fodder for someone to create an Ethereum killer with reduced decentralization and better scale. And in order to scale that though, because it's a brand new network, you have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars from VCs. And they love to do that because they make a lot of money. And this is this endless cycle that we've seen in crypto. There's nothing wrong with that cycle. I'm just pointing it out. The reason they need to raise the funds is because it's a new island. We've got to get people on the island. We've got to get uh, mango salespeople on the island. Uh, we've got to get fishermen on the island. I'm going to stop that metaphor because it's going nowhere. Um, but we, we basically are solving this with cross-roll-up liquidity by meaning that if you listed an asset for sale on any immutable supported roll-up, you can buy them any other roll-up completely atomically. Now, a lot of people have promised this. What's the difference with immutable? Vertical integration. We control not only the roll-up logic, we control the order book, and we also run the passport, the user-facing front-end, which means you can say, as soon as you bid on an asset on another roll-up with funds on one immutable roll-up, rather than as soon as you signal to MEB, someone going and front-running that, you can uh, atomically lock down any bids on that asset and make sure that swap is invisible to the end user and atomic with shared security because everything is running on ZK security models. And otherwise you have the weakest link phenomenon where whatever has the, the chain of the workers link can then bridge into cascading failures across all chains. That summed up as our product strategy around, uh, th and, and a lot of this is not exposed to the end user, right? This is our sort of liquidity and network effect strategy, but that is incredibly important for when we have uh, games be hits, we need that to make sure everyone else is making more money and everyone else can, can get better value. Hey everyone, wanted to give a quick shout out to the Wormhole Foundation. If you are a Bell Curve listener, you know that transferring across chains can be a massive pain. I certainly do. I complain about it on this program all the time. That's why we are super pumped to have partnered with the Wormhole Foundation, the stewards of the Wormhole Protocol. The Wormhole Protocol connects over 30 blockchains and six different runtimes, including Solana, Sui, Ethereum, Layer 2s, and more. And the coolest part about this particular partnership is that they have made custom bell curve NFTs, which you can get and mint for free. You can claim that by just going down into the show notes and clicking on the link. All right, guys, on with the show. Hey, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Swell, a liquid restaking protocol and the issuer of the RSweef liquid restaking token. Now, if you're a listener of Bell Curve, you know that I am just so fascinated by restaking and liquid restaking. I think it is going to be one of the most important trends in Ethereum, and I am really excited for the benefit that it unlocks both users and also Ethereum, the protocol itself. Now, disclaimer, whenever there's yield involved in a product, do your own research. This is not financial advice. You guys know the drill, but Swell is a great team. They have a non-custodial product and they are mission driven on giving you the best liquid staking experience. If you take one benefit away from using liquid restaking, make it be capital efficiency. Now you can earn passive yield from Ethereum. You can earn yield from multiple actively validated services that stack on top of that. And then you can still use our suite as collateral in DeFi. And because I know y'all are a bunch of DGENs, there's a points angle here as well. But in Swell, we call them pearls. So pearls equal points. And if you stake your ETH with Swell, you can earn pearls and future eigenlayer rewards. And when there's a token generation event, you can swap your pearls for Swell tokens. Head over, click the link at the bottom of this episode. Again, just pause what you're doing right now. Go click the link at the bottom of this episode. Check out Swell. Thank you later. Hey everyone, want to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Flood Protocol, the optimal DEX aggregator. Now, Flood is the perfect partner for this episode on the multi-chain future because Flood is solving so many of the issues that we're gonna be talking about this season. And this is relevant for both traders and devs. So if you are a trader, you should definitely head over to FloodSwap and start trading because they solve three massive problems. One, gasless trading, no more pesky trading fees. Two, you don't have to worry about getting front run, MEV free. And then three, they have excellent order routing so that you know that you are getting the best price. So head over to FloodSwap and click the link in the bottom of the show notes. We're gonna send you right there. For the devs out there, you can leverage Flood's flexible hooks, allowing you to make swapping a first class primitive by adding custom order types like TWAPs. Or if you're a wallet builder or something like that, you can actually build your own order flow auction in and start recapturing a bunch of that MEV. If you want to reach out to them, go to devs at flood.bid or just jump right in the Discord. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Appreciate you, Flood. So <clears throat> just to double click into this, um, we started with Immutable X, which is built on Starkware. Um, that, that got things going. Um, now you're moving into the ZK AVM, which is going to be an implementation, um, I, I believe with Polygon as well, um, you know, the, the tech partner on that side. 
um, that becomes the unified application layer for, for games to be launching. Later this year, there's going to be uh, roll-ups, roll-apps, whatever the equivalent is for games, which are going to be unified chains. Maybe just to dive a little bit deeper, I think one of the issues um, we have been asked about and talked about a, a number of times is, um, do users have to pay gas? Or what is the wallet onboarding experience? The second you get hit with that MetaMask login, um, you know, what happens? What's that What's that drop-off? You, you talked about the 95% drop-off at the monetization level. Well, even onboarding is difficult these days. Let, let's talk a little bit more about like what it feels like for a gamer to, let's say, open up a new immutable game uh, on ZK EBM or on a roll app in, in three to six months and, and what that experience would be like versus what it is today. Honestly, I think it's pretty good even today. Um, so, I mean, if anyone's listening... Go to passport.immutable.com, try signing up, give us your feedback. It will take you less than 10 seconds to create a self-custodial wallet that can be used on any immutable game. And it works on mobile, it works on iOS, it works on Android, uh, it, it, it works invisibly uh, if you want to embed it as a game. Uh, so uh, we're really proud of that. We will continue to iterate that. I think that team's only goal is how do you improve user friction and conversion? Like how, how do you make it so as soon as someone hits this point and onboard into a Web3 game, the maximum amount of people go through and the maximum amount of people come back. Uh, and our, our approach is it has to be email sign-on uh, or it has to be some some sort of embedded OAuth. And so you, you can sign on with uh, email, but you can also sign in with iOS and you can also sign in with Android. Um, the second question I think you had, Michael, is uh, DAS. And uh, this is, is well lined up because the other thing we just announced uh, and, and will be live from day one on ZKVM, one of my favorite things about Immutable X is we could say it was gas-free. And that was because it was an app-specific roll-up and people love that, right? They're like, gas is terrible, not because often it's huge, but because even if it's a fraction of a cent, right? The average cost of a transaction on ZKVM, by the way, is going to be typically uh, a, a tenth to a hundredth of a cent. So a hundredth of a cent for, for a transaction. That's that's how cheap it's going to be with Bloodium. The... Problem though is if I'm a new user and I have to buy even a dollar worth of gas fees to onboard, massive conversion cutoff. It doesn't matter how much it is. It's the act of I have to get this asset at all to pay for things. And I have to look at the, the gas fees when I'm transacting in order to, uh, to transact. And what we've done is uh, full gas sponsorship for gamers. So basically the, the thesis is gas free for gamers. Now, of course, on ZKVN, it's not an absolute specific roll up. We have a sequencer. Uh, it, 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 gas is required to manage congestion on the network. But what we've done is games can pay for this on behalf of their users. So if you're a game and for half a million dollars for the lifetime of your game, that can be worth a billion dollars. You can pay for every transaction that would kill conversion. It is an easily and economically good idea for you to do so. And of course, if, if you work with us and, and, and sort of you, you go through our program, we'll, we'll help subsidize a lot of those early costs, similar to AWS helping startups. Uh, and the thesis here is, we can just have an economically good decision for all, all stakeholders and we can make the experience invisible to end players. And that's available if you use Immutable Passport. So just to, to tie it all together, um, I guess first question is like, how should how should we think about Immutable? There's a lot of moving parts. Like in my mind, it's kind of like the Ethereum gaming blockchain. It's kind of like an L1 in and of itself. Um, so I think that's the first question is like, how do you tell the story of that? And then the second one is, you know, if you don't make gas fees, like how does the token work, uh, especially with respect to royalties? How do you describe immutable? Probably not the way we've done on this call, because this is a very technical call for people who are interested in our product strategy and our network, right? So like this is the stuff we, we talk about as, as VCs and, and whereas how are you going to approve? Why, why are we building this stuff? At the end of the day, our marketing is for games and gamers. How, how do we make this seem like, the best place to build your, your game and how do we make this invisible to the end user? Games should not know they're even using Web3 for the majority of people who are onboarding. And, and so the way I describe Immutable is very simple. It's a, a, a platform where you can build a game where people can truly own their assets uh, or a Web3 gaming platform. Um, but of course, it does encompass uh, SDKs, wallets, rollups and, and chains uh, and our, our cross roll up liquidity strategy checkout which is our fiat onboarding and, and, and payment strategy uh, we have uh, the global order book which is our, our marketplace uh, empowerment liquidity strategy and so really we want to be the one stop shop if you need to access something to make your game successful we will support it we even have immutable studios where we're publishing six titles internally and building them 
So we are at the call phase of what is the iOS store's policy? What is the Play Store's policy? What is Epic's policy? How do we design successful economies? How do we make user experience good? If you have not built games internally, you will not build a good product. There is so much feedback. Like Justin Hulog, our chief studio officer, who used to run Riot Games Asia, is on our product team's you know, but every single day saying, this is not good enough. This is not good enough. That means it's already gone through a hundred iterations by the time it even hits our B2B platform customers. And that is how every great platform in existence or most of them have been built. You had uh, Steam start off with Counter-Strike Go. That was their dog food. That was their primary customer. And then they were able to make this incredible platform for, for Web2. Obviously we, we think philosophically different, but objectively that is a, a, a very successful platform. Um, your second question, Vance, was, uh, sorry, remind me. How do you make, how, do, how does the token work? Yeah. So uh, the token, we, we always wanted to give it very clear utility and, and uh, the, the foundation which issued the token basically has uh, every single transaction on Immutable takes a 2% fee on trades of the network. And of this 2%, 20% must be paid for in IMX, the token. And in order to avoid any user friction that can be swapped under the hood, that 20% then is taken to anyone actively uh, staking and using the network and uh, essentially uh, p paid out to those people. So what this gives is this uh, utility that uh, basically is in every single transaction on every single game, on every single roll-up and every single uh, you know, wallet transaction across the immutable platform. And um, has very clear utility. And uh, you know, I, I think it's very similar to a, an exchange model token. Got it. I've got a question, Robbie, about liquid, uh, just this idea of fragmentation. And I was thinking about it when I was using, uh, I've been messing around on Farcaster, Warpcast, just like everyone else has this week. And you know, I think part of the what has contributed to this feeling of L2s being fragmented is every most use cases that people are using on-chain product for today is a financial product. So it creates this sort of like, okay, I like got to move my ETH like from like Coinbase to main chain. And then I got to like bridge it up so I can get access to the shit that I want to buy or like, you yeah, know, to LP on the stage. I read this very funny so, yeah. meme post the other day, which is the the guy on his deathbed and is like, "Tell my family to you know uh, withdraw my stake deed from uh, uh, that." You know, I I, I can't you can recall, but it's very funny. Yeah, I mean, we can imagine what that is like. Ten different yeah. steps, right? Like, God forbid yeah, you yeah. try to do anything over in the cosmos. No offense, you know. <laughs> like, I mean, it's it's tougher over there. So. I feel like that has contributed because of the prevalence of like almost exclusively financial use cases and trading and wanting to buy, uh, you know, coins of various uh, whatever. It has given everyone this idea that things are very fragmented. But if you start to you if you start to look at things from a like a social app like perspective, like on Farcaster, people just go and sign up for Warpcast. And it's like what liquidity? I'm here doing everything that I need to do. It doesn't really matter where it is. I'd imagine it's kind of like that on a game too. It's like yeah, I like went to play my game. And then I signed off. Like, what are you talking about with this fragmentation? Like, does that does that perception like matter a little bit less for your customers? It's actually there's two, there's two there's two answers to this, Michael. I think it's a really interesting point. Um, the first thing I'd say is the fundamental premise of what you've just said is like content comes before liquidity and DeFi, and I think that's actually right. Content actually will beget that, and I think crypto has kind of inverted this because there's so much focus on financial infrastructure, and then proving that that financial infrastructure works with incentives that we're kind of putting the cart before the horse. Like financial services aren't interesting inherently. Financial services service primary use cases. Like the, the reason we have the ability to go long or short on stuff is people want to trade that stuff in the first place. There's that famous example of like, the only reason you can purchase a McChicken burger is because in the 1980s, uh, Ray Dalio helped create the futures contracts that enabled like the creation of, or, or the stabilization of the, the primary assets so they could have stable costs for creating the, I don't know, the flower or something. I'm not going to get too deep. The same thing is kind of happening with Web3. And that's why I think if you, we, we don't even care about the DeFi that built on our chain from game one, because as soon as you have this game with 10 million players, DeFi is going to copy paste over and, and start to service these primary use cases. Like Counter-Strike Go is $15 billion of trades on a Web2 marketplace where the owner constantly fucks with people's ability to trade it on secondary marketplaces and, and, and trade locks it. Imagine that's open. Imagine you have futures contracts on that. Imagine you have loans protocols. This thing is going to explode into a $150 billion market overnight. That's typically the size of uh, secondary financial markets compared to the primary volume. So I think you're precisely right in so far as like build the content and this ecosystem is going to emerge. But where I'll say is resolving at a structural or technical level, 
liquidity fragmentation is still incredibly important because liquidity fragmentation has even higher switching costs for NFTs than it does for ERC-20s. Because at the end of the day, I can move a billion dollars worth of Ethereum for 20 bucks. It's a single transaction. And I can move them from Uniswap to SushiSwap to start my you know, yield earning. That's why you have so many vampire attacks in Web2. If you're, if you're going to try and move a billion dollars of assets from a network that has switching costs, good luck. It's probably going to be, you know, close to a billion assets maybe if it's a dollar per asset each of those has a a a gas fee of like depositing or withdrawing of even a buck you're looking at like using ethereum for three months consecutively in order to transfer assets so having everything be on a unified state of listings and asks and and, um a shared security model is incredibly important for nfts because the ability to have uh, market makers or people seeking to resolve value inefficiencies via arbitrage is much more expensive and more costly um, when it comes to, to sort of unique assets. I was going to say, like, do you have a sense of, I'm almost trying to get like, this is so tough because obviously we're still in the, you know, we're waiting for a lot of these games to launch, but I guess the way that I'd be thinking about it, um, just not knowing as much about your business as you do, is like, okay, we're trying to get, you know, some percentage of daily active users that are actually playing this game. And then maybe there's some sort of metric of like a conversion rate to like, okay, you know, in the course of playing this game, like X amount of people are going to get this asset. And then I need some amount of liquidity to support the, you know, the, the buying and selling of this. Asset. Is that like roughly the right way to think about it? Yeah, we, we often think about what will the, um, I guess, the, the MAU to MAD. We, we have MAD, which is monthly active buyers, people who are like spending value each month. At, at the end of the day, how many people play a game is, is important, but also what people track is what's your ARPU, what's your ARPU, your per paying user. Um, and, and you'll have the same thing in, in Web3. I think the goal is, and I've heard this a, a, a few times, the really interesting stat is like three to 4% of gamers spend money on games, but that's because they don't own anything. What can we get that number to when you can actually own and earn stuff? Especially if you could earn value by playing the game, sell it, and suddenly you've never actually had to spend a dollar, but you have coins in the system. And that eases your onboarding funnel. And how much more can that 3 to 4%, because we know all gaming revenue is power law driven, how much more will they spend when they can sell these assets later on? We know from God's Unchained, the number is between 5 to 10 times the CLV average of uh, trading card game in Web 2, when you can actually sell these assets later on. We've seen incredibly high CLVs in Web 3. That will diminish a little bit as these games go mainstream, because it's going to be diluted by uh, the, the average. But I think the average revenue per paying user is going to remain remarkably high as you have, you know, the whales who spend a million dollars on Game of War, which they do, at the end of the lifetime of that account, maybe they can sell the account on a black market for five cents on the dollar. In this market, it can be something where they can have it go up in value. The change in psychology, the change in the value that that player gets is going to fundamentally change the business model of gaming. And the reason I'm excited is for the first time, it can be incentive aligned. Gaming and publishing, gamers versus publishers have always been an incentive misaligned play. Anytime you have a primary issuer who's trying to sell assets, who can also control the supply of future assets, and so can dilute or increase the value at any point in time, you have this crazy game. Like It's like this watch game where how do you manage the secondary markets of, of watches or any luxury asset? The only way you fix that is with incentive alignment. Stop monetizing via primary sales. Monetize with royalties, with secondary fees. Growing the GMV of these economies, and it's going to become much more of an economic game. I think it's going to be even more lucrative, but the player's interests and the publisher's interests are going to be the same. So just a, a two points of clarification. Uh, number one, I think I uh, just want to make sure everybody knows Guild of Guardians is something that you guys have built in-house. Um, and so, you know, that's where, that's where you get the proprietary information. Um, and, and the second, you know, which I was actually going to ask you and, and kind of lead into was it doesn't necessarily feel like we're reinventing gaming with web three gaming. What we're ultimately doing is providing a new gamer experience with ownership in, and a new business model for the game developers that are building these games. I guess my broader question and, you know, projecting forward based off where you think the industry is and, and the tech timelines and, and roadmaps that we, that we see when, and I know that it's not the case, but you guys have launched, you know, partnerships with, with the likes of Ubisoft and, um, a number of other notable, uh, traditional game developing partners. But when you think this becomes obvious for kind of everybody else in the existing game industry, because it definitely feels like the first iteration of gaming was like, at first they reject you kind of phase and you know at some stage they're going to fight us and a, a acceptance comes at a later date like what do you think the timelines are and what do you think sort of the the unblocks are to get there i think it's really the first hit 
like and and i mean here in the serious sense yeah i mean you know 10 million people buying and trading things an economy within an order of magnitude of what csgo is a success story for either that game's players and creators or that game itself from a revenue perspective that other people start to to clone and i think we've seen that same shift in every other shift in the distribution of gaming mobile gaming only took off when people cracked the code of how do you develop gacha games and mobile monetization in really successful ways and then suddenly, you know, Zynga and, and, and these other companies had games that were cloned multiple times over. Social gaming, which leveraged the, the sort of social graph of Facebook and networks, only took off when you had Farmville, when you had Mafia Wars, and then suddenly everyone cloned these multiple times. Mafia Wars was literally reskinned 15 times into, there was like a salon game for little girls that used the exact same logic under the hood of like, your Mafia man progressing. Uh, the console games and, and free-to-play gaming uh, took off when you had these first really successful free-to-play titles initially popularized really by Korea and Japan. So it, it, it's a game of like, it proves that everyone else is like, oh shit, we have to kind of catch up. Web3 is interesting in that there's been far more investment in Web3 games than any of these nascent uh, categories. So I, I think we've kind of accelerated the curve a little bit, but it's also extra difficult from a, a technology perspective. Uh, and we do have this branding problem which we've got to deal with in the West of making it totally invisible. Like any game you're shipping to the West, you've got to make sure this is either super pro creator, like we are for making them money, which I think Web3 is exceptional at, or it's invisible where, where you know, it's almost too late and they just see the value as they experience playing. So holding your feet to the bar a little bit. Um, the second part of the question was timing. You know, what are what are going to be some of the things that you're looking for in terms of, you know, launch of ZK ABM to the public audience? Or is it going to be something, you know, these games that are launching, like if you had to put your finger in the air and guess, you know, when is it that the average Web3 consumer is like, oh, I found a game that I want to play? When when do we have this like, you know, far cast moment that's happening this week, like with a, with a Web3 game? Um, like, when do you think that is? I am extremely confident, like 95% confidence interval this year. And I would say like 80% confidence is real by July, August in terms of uh, the games going live. We'll have roughly 30 live based on our current timelines uh, by that time. There'll be out of the 260 building on the platform, roughly 35 to 40% of them slated to ship this year. Now, some of those will slip. Maybe you get 30%, let's say 80% of those fail to become hits or 90% of those. And that, and that is what the numbers are going to be, right? And then tokens can be successful, I think, without even the game being true long-term sustainable hits, which is the interesting sort of VC landscape of, of Web3 gaming. But the reality is you only need two or three. I think we'll see three to five hits at at least the million daily active player this year uh, on, I, I, mean, I know, a mutable platform, on a mutable platform. I, I can't speak for the rest of the industry. Let, let me ask you a little bit about this and just like the changing nature of, of, of crypto. Like, Mike Ippolito, you mentioned at the start, like, you know, there's another $3 billion airdrop that went to, you know, probably mostly civil farmers. And it feels like we're just kind of like, there's one side that's like very TVL and like financialization driven. On the other side, there's kind of like, you know, these games where it's like, it's not like big, you know, whales that are doing prosumer transactions. It's like people logging into a, a you know, a Pixels wallet doing whatever, uh, a Guild of Guardians wallet doing whatever. Like, how do you think this changes the, the nature of, of, of the industry? It's like lower value users that are, you know, potentially able to convert into these larger digital economies, but it's like, a, it's like the growth story kind of, if you could tell it a little bit. Yeah. Look, I actually have nothing against to airdrops. I, I think tokens are the most powerful form of user acquisition ever invented. Um, I think it's just what's your return on token spend. Is it part of a sustainable strategy where there's real net inflows into the product you're building? Or is it part of an incentive farming scheme to generate the optics of metrics in order to pump token value in order to take that token value and then redo the cycle? I, I think what I'm more interested in is if a token can represent the future sort of utility or value of an economy, how do you get players to join and disintermediate the billions of dollars of mobile ad spend games have to do every year? There's billions of dollars spent by top games on Gate, uh, on, on uh, Google ads, on, on Facebook ads. There's an opportunity here to just share the value of this future economy and have people themselves grow it socially and virally. Uh, we'll, we'll be experimenting a lot with this with, with Guild of Guardians with a, a sort of share to earn system. And I think underwritten systems where it is uh, sort of uh, value uh, or, or positive sum rather than a negative sum is, is really the fundamental distinction that matters will be incredibly successful and, and will drive huge amounts of user acquisition. Did that answer your question, Vance? I'm not sure if that's... 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, that that is the answer that I think is right. I think a lot of things in crypto right now are growing and fragmenting the space in really good ways. Like seeing all the boomers buying the ETFs is just like a segment that like is not on crypto Twitter. And even seeing just tons of people from the Philippines and India and, you know, all these emerging countries playing these games. It's like I saw in the thread this morning about the, the boomer that wakes up this morning stoked with that 3.6% games on Look, GDC. You know, we're, 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 we're broadening. Pride of the neighborhood. Yeah, we're pride of the neighborhood. Pride we're, of the neighborhood, we're, baby. We're broadening the tent, which is like so long overdue and is so good. But it's just going to be less about like the crypto Twitter set. Like, you know, what you said earlier about like, you know, we're not here to do more content marketing to 200K. Crypto Twitter people, it's about, you know, 20, 30, 40, 100 million users. Like, it, it's so true, um, but it's just going to look so different. And that's that's exciting. I think it's the industry growing up to a certain extent, right? They, they, like at the end of the day, CT will remain. And I love it. I spend so much time in it, but it's like the most advanced, you know, we're talking about bell curve. Like this is the 99th, 0.9th percentile of, of Web3. It's the VCs. It's the people who are farming airdrops. It's the people who have, uh, you know, uh, self-custodial accounts and use ledgers. That is not going to be the majority of the world. And, and that doesn't stop adoption. I think it's just different segments. Uh, what, what I was going to say is, you know, there will be a time also where we shift from TBL as a, as a metric of evaluation or, you know, transactions per second or transactions per month. And we actually switched to real users. And I know that that's what you guys focus on, daily active, monthly active users. Oh God to good revenue, Michael. Well, I, I mean, that comes after, yeah. which, right? But, but, yeah. there but, will but, be but it is, like, it is different. And real people are, yeah. It, it is different. Like, even, even as I think about blockchains, like, I think we all assume that the cost of block space, other than like ETH L1 and Bitcoin, is going to get driven to zero. And so it's like, all right, what's beyond that? Is it like these kind of like, you know, it's the 2% fee plus the royalties plus kind of whatever ecosystem, you know, incentives that you guys have? Is it, you know, I guess maybe we could still live on gas fees, but like that doesn't even feel compatible in a world where like you have 100 million monthly active users. Like the nature of blockchains will change just due to the types of customers they're accommodating. I think that's cool. I totally agree. Um, what else do we have, guys? Uh, well, actually, I've got uh, a question just like maybe on the more almost like nitty gritty go to market. Um, you know, from your perspective, Robbie, obviously it's in Immutable's best interest if uh, the games that are, you know, building on your platform get a whole bunch of users. Um, but do you like from your perspective, would you ever kind of get involved yourself or do you let every game kind of run their own go to market strategy? And if you kind of Put your thumb on the scale is that an issue from like hey if i help this person with their go to market and i don't help that you know what i'm saying like what what is the go to market for immutable look like versus you just let the games kind of do their own thing obviously we can't help everyone to the same extent otherwise priority doesn't exist so we try and invest in infrastructure that it's going to fundamentally help that's why we talk so much about liquidity fragmentation you know apple and sort of tim cook doesn't personally help every game building on the ios store but you still make way more money if you deploy a game on that because the product and network value is so high. That's, I think, the core long-term product strategy. But absolutely, we we help the top tier of games. I, I think the, the top 50 or so, um, and especially the ones launching this year, we will be pointing a ton of help and, and value at. Um, obviously, with the launch of, of ZKVM, we'll have a lot of things in store um, around making this the, the, the loudest launch of, of Web3 uh, and making sure we can sort of help King make the first select games that, that launch there. So we, we have some things behind the scenes here we'll share. We also do a lot of help to basically advise on economics, on tokenomics, on uh, their, their go-to-market from a, even uh, how do they get listings, etc. All of our IP we've developed from the studio, we just share for free with every single game building on the platform. Um, we have a huge partner success team where we're basically trying to support these games as much as possible. But at the end of the day, and, and this is really important, if the game would fail without our help, they're probably not a great game. And and like we, we can help people who would succeed, mega succeed and learn how to succeed in Web3. But the idea of making a game that otherwise would not be successful because of the platform itself is, is inefficient and it doesn't make sense. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important because th these games have to live or die by being successful, good, retentive games. And then we can pour sort of, you know, fuel and, and, and gasoline on the successful ones and, and especially help them with the Web3 side. I think that's where we can help Web2 incumbent games moving in, uh, like the Ubisoft of the world. Um, but otherwise, you're 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 basically throwing uh, you know good money after bad. 
which goes to, you know, the way that you look at new opportunities as well, right? From a business development perspective, you're evaluating them just as much as they're evaluating you. Yeah, it's just know if, if a BD reaches out to you in Mutable, we've already looked at your game. We've already said this is good enough for us to support. Uh, so, yeah, it, I, I guess that's, that's we, we, we have a huge internal, essentially a VC team looking at every single game in the market and being like, what's the market map? You know, uh, how successful do we think these can be and, and how can we help them? Yeah. In, in just uh, closing closing minutes here, uh, I would actually be curious, uh, Vance and Michael, can I turn it over to you for just a second? Like, I am curious. It's just been on my mind this week watching this airdrop. And I, I was like scratching my head because it's very difficult to come away with a logical reason for why uh, some of these recent airdrops would be trading at the value that they're trading. And um, I, it, it is interesting to me because on the one hand, you can look at an airdrop and be like, look at how much money this protocol just spent. I mean, you know, it's, it's sometimes hundreds of millions of, of dollars, but at the same time, like, would they be where they are without that? And it's not really a cash expense, right? It's not like they actually raised that money and then gave that money away. It like kind of came out of nowhere. You know, it's in some... We don't know where the money came from. There's always a cost, right? And like, look, I saw this $3 billion airdrop where someone tried to sell 8 million and it nuked the price 50%. So the money is real until it's gone. And once it's gone... You know, price can drive sentiment and, and higher valuations, but like on the way down, it can deflate you like a balloon. Um, value doesn't matter. Value doesn't matter without liquidity. Right. And like, you know, just <laughs> from from like an investment perspective on, on IMX, like ha not having a lot of that overhang, having like good investors, a corporate structure and a lot of the tokens still on the balance sheet. It's like, that's just more firepower for where I think the industry is going and like, Part of me believes we've explored most of the ways to build blockchains at this point. DeFi, you know, we're, we know that's going to get big, kind of correlated to the price of where the majors go and how they use this money. Gaming is like this whole other thing where it represents like this totally different future for the industry. And I think, you know, that that's kind of just like where the sustainable value is going to be built. Like we're we're selfishly trying to turn you know four hundred million into four billion. Like that's our goal. Um, Unless you hit a company that's really world changing, you can't do that. Like you're not doing that on airdrop farming. So that that's kind of my perspective. Um, but Michael, what do you think? I mean, all of the above. I think um, all of these valuations, I think, are getting you know bid up for different reasons. Um, and yeah, taking it back. I mean, it, it goes back to users and people actually using the application, and then revenue that's generated off of those people, you know, wanting to pay for things. And we have kind of drifted away from that in my mind. I think there's some, you know, obviously highly profitable DeFi protocols that exist, but, you know, frankly, we haven't seen a consumer application where we have that same characteristic. And, you know, that's our thesis around gaming. Well, last thing I'll say is like, you know, I think there is a view that we're, I think very minority that we're like at the end of history for crypto where it's like ETH and Bitcoin are just going to become these big macro assets and traded by these big hedge funds and like, that's kind of all we need to do. I think that's partially true. I think there's a lot of momentum there. It's going to happen anyways. But like, there's also this like, what if this is still like another 30, 40, 50 year trend where we actually bring in tens of millions of users and it changes completely. Like I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that like we're not at the end of history and then it's just going to keep expanding. But the big old ass to cycle. Exactly. I mean... <laughs> Look, if you stay in the game, it's still a super cycle. If you fucking blow yourself up, that's your own fault. But I think it, the key I, is... I saw my, all my eight of the DAO hack in uh, 2000 and Oof, 16. Or 16. So, like, I, I have not sold a, a single uh, token since then. It's like... Well, like, re like, respect to you. Like, you know, I feel like they're... Uh, like, we've been at it for all, probably 10, 11 years at this point. At least, like, holding, you know, owning crypto, doing stuff with it. Like, it, the OGs are the ones who are kind of, like, still delivering and see the future and it's it's cool to see a lot of people kind of get recognition and their due right as everything's about to kind of take into a new form factor just never become the main character <laughs> <laughs> trying not to trying not to what do you guys think do you have votes on who you think the main character is for this this next cycle i don't think we're gonna have one i, I was thinking about this earlier like the sbf mm -hmm. anom anomaly was so strange that it would be near impossible to replicate that like the nick like the nick whites of celestia and like you know like those are the founder archetypes that are like riding these huge token weight but like he's not sbf 
You know, yeah. he's not with Bill Clinton at the World Economic Forum talking about, you know, how we're going to do all this stuff. And a lot of these are more decentralized, I think, is, is the other thing. It requires not just this huge thing, but also a single person that is less running a, a community and, and supporting an ecosystem and more just kind of like they're the celebrity. And I think we have, even though we have equal successes, we have fewer of those. Yeah, which I, is cool. I, I would say no main characters this cycle. Um, there's there's not even main characters in tech. Well, like Evan Spiegel or like Alex Karp or like Satya Nadella. None of those people Elon. are like, you know. Hey, Robbie, Elon. I know you got to jump. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, hey, I have a really hard spot. This is awesome. Play. Play. All right. See you, Robbie. But, but none of those people are like main characters. They work for a fucking company that's growing a lot. That's what they do. They're not on Twitter being like, you know, let's engage with the unwashed masses every day. What about Elon, though? He's kind of main character I was, right I was now. Literally about Dude, to say, I mean, he's, he's the only main character. He's the only main character. Yeah. Like, it's like him, Tucker, and Trump that literally on my Instagram, I may, that may be more of what I search or look at. But, like, it just feels like those are the three main characters on the planet. Keep, keep in mind, uh, you know, Elon just lost $65 billion of compensation. So he did. He did take a pretty, pretty big L. Oh, I know this is a departure from crypto gaming, but what did you what did you guys think about that? I so I I looked into it a little bit, and I guess the the technical reason. So there was a shareholder. There was a uh, class action. Vote. Yeah. Well, it, it was initiated by a shareholder who, in uh, I think 2015, 16, bought nine shares of Tesla, held them uh, through this entire period. 2018, this compensation package is voted on by the shareholders, 80% acceptance rate. Board obviously votes on it. Outside compensation board member was the one who initiated it. Um, every $5 billion of market cap in, or sorry, every $50 billion of market cap increase that Elon creates, uh, he gets 1% of the company. So basically, you know, it, he, so those that don't know, Elon did not start Tesla. Elon bought Tesla. And because of that, he has, relative to other founder CEOs, a lot less economics in the company than you would expect. He only owns about 12.5% of the company. And, you know, maybe that's a lot, maybe that's not a lot, but he, he has never had very much, you know, shareholder control because he doesn't own that much of the shares relative. And, you know, the compensation model was long-term. It was five years. He, he had to increase the value of the company over the next five years. And he also has to hold all of those shares for five years become, before they become invest, before they become vested. So it's not like he can just, you know, get his money and dump on retail and, and like and we're still waiting for another five years. Twenty twenty eight is the first year where he would have access to this, you know, compensation. All all of this to Vance's point is going to come back. It, there, there's now a movement. Uh, there's actually going to be a shareholder vote to change the state of registration from Delaware to Texas for, for Tesla, uh, which means that if, you know, they come back to this and say, Hey, we want to relitigate this. Um, I, I think there would be a new, uh, new judge, uh, and new circuit that they'd be looking at. I just want to point out to people how bizarre, like how, um, what an outlier Elon is for signing up to a pay package like that. Like if you've been part of compensation negotiations, like most people like will opt so hard for like the sure thing. Like how many CEOs do you guys know that would take? Oh yeah. No, nothing, nothing guaranteed. Are you kidding me? That's also, also there are no CEO pay packages in the fortune 500 that have anything close to a 10 year time horizon. Zero. Every single other CEO is like, over the next year, here's the stock-based comp that you'll get and invest over that year. Like, that's the maximum duration that most of these have. And a lot of them are based on uh, earnings per share, EPS, which you right. can get from buyback. He, his were based on revenue and production targets. It was like unforgeable. Uh, and e EBITDA margins, but yes. EBITDA margins, too. Okay, but I mean, those are pretty good representations of the company, right? Like, that's actual growth yeah. that you have to deliver. Yeah, I thought it was just now that the I guess the devil's advocate side of this is that what this Delaware court found is that he didn't have an independent board, right? Like Kimball's on there, his brother, and there were a lot of close relationships. Just Steve Jerbertson. The the long it, it, it felt coordinated. That plus the Wall Street Journal drugs article 
plus the like you know just the long knives every once in a while come out for these different characters that this is my broad point elon is the main character right now and he took a intermediate l but i think he'll get him back dude having him as the world's richest person or whatever he is now is like the most bullish fucking thing like we we need people to lead from the front with principle with resources it's it's great Here's an example. I was at dinner last night and I was sitting next to this guy who I met for the first time and I asked him what he did. He goes, oh, I have two jobs. I was like, okay, I need to know more. And he goes, well, I spent the last nine years at Tesla and I've been a software engineer working on AI and, and have a bunch of different roles there. Um, but, you know, I really wanted to work on Twitter as well as soon as Elon bought it because I really didn't want that company to die. And so I've been doing my job at Tesla and a new job at Twitter in the meantime. Like, imagine the leader who can command people like that, who are obviously capable and, and you know, 10x engineer level caliber to work 20 hours a day or 16 hours a day, whatever it is. It's pretty insane. What a goat. Yeah. Anyway. All right, guys. This was uh, any, anything else you want to cover? This was a fun one. I'm glad it. we could bring Robbie on. Thanks, bruv. Hi, friends. Talk soon. See you, guys. Bye. Hey, everyone. Mike here. If you're a Bell Curve listener, you know that transferring assets across chains can be a massive pain. I certainly do. I complain about it on this program all the time. That is why we are incredibly excited to have teamed up with the Wormhole Foundation, the stewards of the Wormhole Protocol. And the coolest part about this particular partnership is that they have made custom Bell Curve NFTs, which you can get and mint for free. So click the link at the bottom of this episode. Take you get your free NFT.